thank you so much for uh, for speaking to what I think is the seventh or eighth year of my classes. We're we're incredibly grateful. Well, uh, Arvind, it's uh, it's always a pleasure uh, and an honor. And uh, you know, in spite of all my past uh, past issues and uh, and bloopers, you keep calling me back, which is great. And the other thing is your you and your class are willing to serve as uh, guinea pigs, which is also really good. So uh, uh, this time I have a um, a brand new uh, talk that I have never given before. Uh, so it's a, it's a first time uh, first time I'm giving this, which is uh, which is exciting for me. So, uh, but uh, hopefully it'll go over uh, uh, okay on your end uh, and. Uh, and everyone will uh, will like it as well. Uh, is the audio good? It's flawless. All right, perfect. Okay. So, anyway, you know, you know, a few thousand years ago, we were told about Moses going to the top of the mountain and then coming back with the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and uh, that that story is slightly off. So, you know. I have I have a lot of conversations with God, and um, in one of my conversations, you know, he said that you know, Monish, when when uh, Moses was coming down the mountain, he dropped the tablets, and they shattered into many different pieces, and so my commandments were lost. But he felt really bad, and humanity was expecting these commandments, so he made them up, and. Uh, We've never had the real commandment, so he he gave me the real commandments to usher onto the world through Arvind's BC class, and uh, so that's that's what I'm going to try to do. And uh, so God also said that He really wanted to focus the commandments on investment managers and not humanity. And unfortunately, Moses kind of broadened the uh, the scope of the of the task he had been given. And uh, so these are uh, the commandments for uh, for investment managers, and uh, and uh, and Moses was right; they're exactly ten commandments. So the, he got that part correct. But anyway, the uh, the first commandment. So you know, I don't know, I don't know how long these are going to take uh, to go through. So I'll try to. Uh, I'll try to speed them along so that we have enough time for Q and A and and such. And uh, and certainly, if uh, if if the flock is looking for more clarity on one or more commandments, we can certainly do that during the Q and A. So anyway, the first the first commandment is, uh, "Thou shall not skim off the top." And what what the Lord means by that? Is that you know one of the things with all these commandments is that um, the reason they are they are being presented is that most uh, most participants in the investment management business violate them uh, and they are sinners and so we are trying to kind of improve the lot if you will so skimming off the top basically is setting up an investment operation. Where you're either taking, you know, some percentage of fees uh, as a fixed fee, and in the case of hedge funds, they're usually taking one or two percent off the top, and they're adding uh, performance fees on top. And uh, you know, two of the the original practitioners, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, uh, they practice the art with uh, no fees off the top. Uh, so Buffett had. Uh, I think 0625 once he merged all his partnerships I think in 1962 where he took no fees off the top and and Charlie I, th I think had uh, a third uh I think one third uh above zero is my uh my 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 belief I think that's what he did uh, but of course he was uh that was a kind of a specialist operation a little different operation that he was running and very little capital but uh, but the bottom line is that uh, uh, both both Buffett and Munger have said that if um, if you're in the investment management business, uh, what should have already happened before you 
uh, set up your own shop or started managing other people's money is practice the art on your with your own with your own limited assets and uh, and if you if you did well with those assets then you know the power of compounding is such that uh, even a small amount of money becomes quite significant uh, after a few years i mean if you're uh, uh, if you're uh, if you're compounding at uh, anything uh, north of 15 20 25 percent which you should be able to do on small small amounts of capital uh, i mean your your money will be doubling every kind of you know four to seven years uh, type type deal and so even a small amount becomes fairly large in a few years um, which which gives you the uh, ability to uh, in effect, uh, live off that that base while the assets are growing. So anyway, that's the first commandment. Um, the second commandment: uh, Thou shall not have an investment team. So again, you know, investment management is not a team sport. It's it's really designed to be an individual pursuit. And uh, an investing team is, in many ways, an oxymoron. And uh, one of the one of the you know there are many reasons why it's an oxymoron. But one of the basic reasons is that um, any two humans are going to have differing circles of competence. And uh, so, if I were to have, for example, an analyst uh, on my team, and uh, that analyst was very bright, and uh, he or she came up with uh, some investment ideas. Uh, I may I may reject them simply because uh, I have a different circle of competence, and so uh, which is really not doing uh, justice to the analyst, if you will. And um, and the second is that we we don't have we don't need that many stocks. Uh, in our portfolio, and so uh, in a year uh, we have plenty of time uh, to research many stocks and to find, uh, you know, two, three, or four of them that uh, uh, that kind of fit the bill, if you will. So uh, they shouldn't. And the the other thing is a uh, the investment uh, analysis process is really the fun part of the job. So. Uh, you really don't want to be delegating the fun part because I wouldn't know what you'd be doing then if you weren't uh, kind of analyzing investments. You know that's the most fun part. Then the the third commandment: Thou shall accept that thy shall be wrong at least one third of the time. And uh, you know some of these commandments leaked leaked out from God over the years and. Uh, this uh, this uh, this comes from uh, John Templeton, and uh, uh, basically um, the investment the, the investment process is one where we are uh, we are extrapolating or we are trying to extrapolate uh, the future of a business or the future of many businesses, and by definition uh, that is uh, a very inexact science. Uh, there are a multitude of factors that are going to affect uh, every business into the future, and especially when we're trying to uh, forecast or uh, figure out what happens to a business five years from now or ten years from now. Uh, it is it is an exercise uh, fraught with difficulties and definitely fraught with a high error rate. And uh, so basically, if if I were to pick, or in my let's say my current portfolio, if ten stocks made up most of the portfolio, there are probably at least four of them that will not behave in the future in the way I expect I expected them to behave when I made the investment. Uh, so it doesn't mean that forty percent of the time I will lose money. What will happen is that at least 40% of the time, I will either um, not make as much money as, as I thought, or I might lose money on some investments, or they might flatline, or they might even do better. Um, 
uh, far better than I thought, all of the above. And, uh, and so the, this, is a, this is an exercise in humility in terms of managing investments. And, uh, and one has to always accept the fact that uh, the, the future tra trajectory of businesses is, um, and predicting that trajectory is at, at best an, an ex inexact science. And uh, so we have to be kind of humble enough to accept the fact that, um, you know, even our highest conviction ideas may or may not get to where we expect to get them to. Then we get to commandment number four. Uh, thou shall look for hidden P of one stocks. And uh, so, you know, here's the, here's the way the world works. So, Maybe there are around, let's say, 50,000 publicly traded companies globally. And let's say I set up a screen which said, I want to look at all companies that trade at 40 times earnings or less. Uh, the odds are I'd have a, you know, kind of tens of thousands of businesses that would fit that screen. If then I change that to a P of 30, I'd still have, you know, several thousand businesses. P of 20, still several thousand. P of 10, still uh, maybe, you know, north of thousand, maybe well below, well above that. And as I keep tightening that noose, you know, to P of five, P of three, P of one, there will still be some businesses that will slip through. Now, those are the, uh, the non-hidden P E of ones. Uh, but but what we what we want to look for is the hidden PE of ones, which means they 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 are a PE of one, but they don't show up as such on a screen. Uh, so for example, and and they can be a PE of one uh, based on future earnings. Uh, they may not be a PE of one on today's earnings. I mean, in in 2012 when I invested in Fiat Chrysler. Um, you know, it was trading at less than five dollars a share, and uh, the company had had forecasted in uh, that in a few years, uh, actually 2018, uh, that they would make about five dollars a share. And actually, as we are coming into 2018, uh, you know, they spun off uh, Ferrari. But if I if I include the whole pie, uh, including Ferrari, they they exceeded that number. So what we paid in 2012, uh, PE01 uh, materialized in 2018, and um, and so the I mean the end result is that that uh, that investment went up seven or eight x in that period. So generally speaking, when you do PE01s, in general, good things happen to you. And um, another stock. Uh, I think I'd mentioned in uh, in your class, Arvind, a few years back was Ipsco. It was a steel company. And um, at the time I was I uh, investing in Ipsco, I think it was 2004 or thereabouts, 2004, 2005. And um, Ipsco was trading, uh, if you just screened it, it was trading at three times earnings. Uh, but one third of the market cap was in cash, and uh, so if you if you kind of adjust it for the cash, because uh, they had basically they were trading at two times earnings, and the 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 earnings in the next two years uh, with the company's um, uh, own own uh, guidance and such uh, was what the company expected to make in cash flows in the next two years, and so basically you had. Um, a third in cash and two year, in the next two years, um, uh, earnings coming out, and and there was ab absolutely no visibility beyond the two years. So this was a very cyclical business. It was possible that after two years, earnings would just fall off a cliff. But my thinking then was that if we held the stock for two years, we got all our money back. And at that point, uh, I just wanted to see what the stock would trade at. You know, uh, it it had to trade for something because it had all these uh, 
huge plants and infrastructure and everything else. And um, so what happened in that case is a, a year after I bought the stock, the company announced they had one more year of visibility and earnings were going to continue the way they had been happening, which means now we had, in effect, three years of visibility. So we were in the in the black. And then uh, as we were getting close to two years, um, uh, someone came and bought the company. And uh, and we ended up with about a about a 4x return uh, on the initial, initial purchase in less than two years. And um, so anyway, the, the PE of ones, what I, what I noticed is that in the last, um, in the last 19 years or so that I've been running for Bri funds, it's, it's happened at least six or seven times uh, that we found PE of ones like Fiat Chrysler or like IFSCO. Uh, very early, early on, I'd invested in Stewart Enterprises, uh, which was in the funeral services business. That was, that actually was sitting at a P of two in value line. I, I opened up value line I, I, as I do every week. I always look for the P of ones uh, in value line. Usually they're not there, uh, but you can find P of twos quite quite commonly. Usually uh, those are businesses that are good to avoid. Uh, but every once in a while uh, there is a gem. Uh, that shows up. So, for example, uh, uh, the reason I was kind of interested in Stewart Enterprises when it showed up is that they're in the business of burying dead people, and uh, they're in the funeral services business. And one thing I had read a long time ago about the funeral services business is that out of all the uh, business SIC codes, uh, you know, industry categorizations, uh, funerals, funeral homes have the lowest rate of business failure. Uh, so if you look at across industries, across a number of uh, any industry, the lowest rate of business failure is funeral homes. And the reason for that actually becomes obvious if you think about it. Uh, so first of all, no one in this classroom, all of you gifted people, is planning to go into the funeral services business. I can almost bet on that. Uh, there are no 22-year-olds I know of who say, you know what, um, I think I'm going to go into the funeral services business because it has the lowest rate of failure. It's such an awesome business. That's what I'm going to do. It just doesn't happen. So first of all, the, um, the people entering the business are few and far between. And then the second is that when your aunt or uncle who you love so much passes away, you don't go about seeking the low bid to have their last rites done. Uh, you might at the most reach out to, uh, typically you'll reach out to the place that ideally your family has been using for many generations and hopefully uh, get, it, get it done that way. But even if, even if that's not the case, uh, you'll try to reach out to some neighborhood uh, funeral services operation and uh, Whatever they tell you, you're not going to start negotiating on the phone, and uh, you're probably not even making five calls to get the lowest bid. So this is not a business where you're going to seek out, uh, unless you hated that particular relative, uh, you're not going to particularly seek out a low bid. And, uh, and of course, you've got all the upsells with air-conditioned coffins and everything else in between uh, to, to make you feel really good. And um, anyway, so uh, so basically, um, the hidden P O ones is really good for your health and your financial health. I mean, and uh, so uh, looking for them is um, is a great exercise. And in fact, uh, I just I just got back from Istanbul uh, last night, and. Um, I think it was only P O P O ones that I visited. I was swimming in P O ones. Uh, it was quite the orgasmic experience. Um, anyway, so that's commandment number four to go hunting for P O ones. Then uh, commandment five: Thou shall never use Excel. So this actually kind of goes hand in hand with commandment four. And even it goes hand in hand with not having an investment team. But basically, if you can't 
figure it out in your head. So the investment process is is really quite simple. You know, if if a company, let's say, has a market cap of a billion dollars, and let's say it's trading at uh, 20 times earnings, so it trailing earnings are 50 million, for example, and let's uh, let's assume those are owner earnings that you can withdraw as dividends and such to keep it simple. Well, the the billion dollar market cap, uh, whether whether that is undervalued or overvalued or fairly valued, uh, one can only uh, make a judgment of that if one can figure out the cash flows that are coming out of the business over the next, I mean, it's from now to judgment day, but you can approximate that to be now, uh, between now and the next 10 or 20 years, because after that, it really doesn't matter. The terminal values become too small. And uh, so if this business is trading at 20 times earnings, and if earnings are expected to grow at let's say 10 or 15% a year, then what you can do, and, and if you have a very high degree of conviction that that 10 or 15% rate of earnings growth is sustainable for a very long period of time, maybe 15 or 20 years, um, then you can actually you know, run the math. You can say, okay, year one, the earnings are 50 million, year two, the earnings are 60 million, year three, the earnings are, you know, I mean, if you're growing at 20%, but if you're growing at 10%, 50, 55, 60 and a half, you know, 66 and change, and just keep going from there. And and then you have to discount each of those by your expected rate of return. You know, uh, so for example, if I, if I want a 20% rate of return on this investment, I have to start discounting those future cash flows. Uh, at that at that 20% rate, and then I have to because if I'm getting 55 million a year from now, uh, my cost of capital is 20 million. So that 55 million is really worth like 44 million uh, because I'm not getting it today. And so as I discount all those future cash flows and uh, and run those numbers. It will be very hard to get to one billion uh, because because uh, you know the earnings are growing at ten percent, but your expectation is twenty, so it will be a kind of a declining future stream. Every year will be less than fifty million, in effect, and um, uh, in present value and. Uh, and so the math just doesn't work. Now, if you reduce your return expectations to something like 8%, um, it may work. If you said, I only want a 7 or 8% return, that may work. But even then, the, there are some heroic assumptions. And we already saw what Templeton said, that you're going to be wrong one third of the time, and capitalism is brutal. So unless this is a fast-growing funeral services operation, uh, it's not going to be there clocking 20% or 10% a year for 15 years uh, because it's just difficult in business uh, to have that much of a runway without people coming in to take your motorway. And so, so the thing is that how do we get around that? Well, the, the, way, the way we get around that is by making the math really simple. And the way we make the math really simple is we go back to PEO1. And uh, when we go back to PEO1, all the math becomes really easy. Because then if I want to make like 25% a year, well, I, I get my money back in two or three years and I still have the business is still producing cash. And you'll find that it'll deliver that return. And it might deliver that return at a PE of two as well or three as well. And uh, But once you start getting to high single digits or double digits, uh, generally speaking, the math doesn't work so well. It's, it's, it's a lot harder to make it work. And, and I think like, for example, 
if if we were to look at, uh, I mean, I think uh, like a simple case is if we look at the uh, a business like Apple. So let's 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 take a simple case that Apple is worth exactly a trillion dollars. Uh, I, I haven't been tracking it. I think it's a little bit above that. But let's say it's exactly a trillion dollars. And let's say I want a, uh, you know, I'm an unreasonable guy and I want a like 25% annual return on my capital, for example. You know, Arvind knows my license plate says compound 26. Uh, so, uh, so if I want a 25 or 26% return on my money, the first year that business has to produce 260 billion in owner earnings. And um, I don't think that's what Apple is producing right now. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe some, uh, someone in the class knows, uh, or maybe you can look it up, Arun. Arun, what is the trailing PE of Apple, approximately? Is it like 10 times or something? I think it's uh, higher than that, but I can get it for you. Uh, yeah, so, but let's, let's be generous. Let's say it's trading at 10 times earnings. Let's say that what, it, what it's saying is that Apple's making 100 billion a year. Okay, so I need 260 billion for my 26% or 25%. It's making, let's say, 100 billion. And then, and then a year from now, let's say, let's say it's 115 billion. Let's say I'll give it that, you know, they've got a rocking market position. Earnings grow by 15%, it goes to 115 billion. And let's say for the next 10 years, it's compounding at 15%. Even even with 100 billion in earnings compounding at 15% for 10 years, which means that in the 10th year it will be 400 billion, uh, because in five years it'll double to 200 billion, and 10 years it'll double again to 400 billion. That 10th year 400 billion uh, is not worth 260 billion today. Because, because you know, when I discount that at the 26% rate, I have to. It will it will go down below 100 uh, uh, because it's uh, uh, just you know it needs to be doubling every three years and such. So anyway, the bottom line is that if your return expectations are something like 7% a year, uh, and Apple is growing at you know six seven percent a year or something. Uh, it may work. So, so one of the one of the things that you can do with just playing with these two three numbers, which is market cap, current earnings, and what you expect earnings to grow at. And of course, you know, uh, I think a lot of people would have difficulty uh, getting to assumptions that Apple will grow 15% a year, uh, bottom line for 10 or 15 years uh, without any hiccups. That may happen, it's a very dominant company in a dominant position, but we've seen a lot of past dominant companies have problems in uh, in these areas. So, uh, so the thing is that when I look at something like Apple, it doesn't even take a femtosecond to take a pass. Um, and now if we had Apple at like something like three times earnings, you know, like trillion dollar market cap making 350 billion a year, growing at whatever, you know, 15% or something, even someone like me might get interested, you know. Uh, so so the thing is that a PE of three on Apple might get me excited and uh, a PE of 10, uh, not quite as exciting. And uh, so, Manish so, ITA is saying that the PE is uh, closer to 20 times, so you're going to be a lot less excited. Ouch, man. Oh. That's so <laughs> hard. <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, the thing is that, uh, you know, so if you, if you run this same math, starting at 50 billion, which is where trailing earnings are, and even if you take heroic assumptions of 20% growth, unabated, I still can't get to the promised land. You know, as you know, with the commandments, I've been to the promised land, but, but I can't get to the promised land 
with it. So, so that was the fifth, fifth uh, uh, commandment: Thou shall never use Excel. And as you saw with all the math we did, you know, we didn't even need a calculator. Forget Excel. We just did it in our heads. So there is no need for Excel. And if you find yourself reaching for Excel, what that means is um, is you take a pass. Uh, the, it's an automatic pass the moment you feel, oh, I need Excel to figure this out. If you need Excel, it means you need to take a pass. If you can't do the math on the fingers in one hand, you need to take a pass. If you're going to two hands, there's a problem. You need to be doing the math with one hand and no calculator and what's between your ears. That's it. Uh, like I said, these are all things that Arvind will never talk to you about. It's only me and you that can talk about such things. Um, then commandment number six. Thou shall always have a rope to climb out of the deepest well. So in case some of you didn't understand that fully, let me try to decipher what the good Lord meant by commandment number six. So when I was, when I was growing up, my, my dad uh, was an entrepreneur and uh, he was really good at starting a number of businesses with nothing, no capital. And he was really good at getting them to some uh, some scale. I mean, you know, some of these would get up to north of 100 employees and such. I mean, it, they would they would move pretty quickly. But he was always uh, very aggressive with his growth plans and leverage and such, and overly optimistic. And invariably, uh, these businesses would blow up. And so he went through uh, a number of bankruptcies. Um, you know, uh, so I, I, when I was growing up, and my parents were very bad uh, kind of financial uh, planners or savers. So uh, as the business did, so did so did our, you know, household fortunes, if you will. So uh, when the business was doing well, things were loose and going well at home. And when the business blew up, we, we didn't have money for rent. We didn't have money for groceries. We were you know, asking relatives to help us out, asking friends. And so it was a, it was a tough situation. And um, one time, I think when I was like, what, maybe nine or 10 years old and my father had gone bankrupt, um, he had this guy who was a, a astrologer uh, show up to our house, our apartment every Sunday. And this astrologer would have all these, you know, orange robes with a bunch of marks on his forehead with a bald head and all that. And he would have all these different charts and he would tell my father about the future. And then my father would pay him and then the guy would come the following week. And this was kind of a weekly thing going on. And um, I told my dad after observing this for, for a few weeks that, you know, because my dad was an engineer, he was a very rational guy. And I said, you know, you have to know that this person is just talking utter nonsense, you know. And uh, so my dad, my dad said to me that I am, I am at the bottom of a well and I need a rope to climb out of the well. And this orange robed guy is my rope because when I pay him, he makes sure that he tells me that the future is great because he knows if he says that the future is not great, he's not coming back the following week. So every week when I have my session with him, he is telling me about these future businesses I'm gonna start and all this prosperity that's gonna come. And I, I, need, I need something to climb out of the well that I'm in. And one of the things that surprised me repeatedly what my dad was that the ability to bounce back. I mean, I noticed as he, as he got older that his bounce back was harder than it used to be when he was younger. It was just, yeah, I think it was just harder uh, going through it over and over. But, but I was always very surprised at the quickness with which as he was you know, putting one business 
uh, you know the uh, the last semblance of it going uh, going under he was already kind of thinking about the next one and and such so in the investment business we are going to have gyrations and we're going to have periods when performance is great and we're going to have periods when performance is not so great and so for example in uh, in the financial crisis 2008 09 uh, pabrai funds from the peak uh, in june of in june of 2007 to the bottom in march of 2009 uh, the funds dropped between 65 and 70 percent it's a huge drop and and you know when i when i told you about commandment number one thou shall not skim off the top so basically if if my my fund were worth let's say 600 million dollars or thereabouts let's say in june of uh, june of uh, 2007 uh, basically, by June of 2008, in order to collect a fee, it needed to be at at least 636 million, you know, 6% return, and then I get paid. Instead, the funds were below 200 million. So 600 million goes to 200 million. The base level required to earn a fee is 636 million. I am in a very deep well. And um, so I thought back to the guy in the orange robes. And unfortunately, I didn't have his email address. Uh, and I don't even know if he was alive then. He may have passed away probably. So I was looking for the guy in the orange robes, but he was nowhere to be found. So I said, I'm at the bottom of the well. And I need a rope. I need a rope to pull me out. And um, what I did is I, I violated commandment number five. I first sought the forgiveness of the Lord and said, you know, in order to, in order to follow commandment number six, I need to temporarily uh, get a pass on commandment number five. And after many years, I fired up Excel. And... Uh, and what I did is I, I took my portfolio and I put in prices for all the stocks that were in my portfolio in, at the end of 2010 and at the end of 2011. So I, I put my best guess as what these companies would be trading at uh, at the end of 2010 and end 2011. And of course, things had collapsed, you know, I mean, there were there were things, I mean, there, there were a lot of bargains at that time. I mean, anything I was investing in went up several times after that. And uh, when I looked at the numbers of the aggregate portfolio at the end of 2010 and at the end of 2011, it was well north of 600 million, partially because I had control over what went into those cells. Just like, just like the astrologer had control over what he was going to say the future was going to do. And, um, you know, like we hear about Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs' distorted reality field. Um, we need distorted reality to climb out of wells. And um, so what I did is instead of focusing on the $200 million number in my mind, I focused on the 2010 or 2011 number when I was going to be in fee earning territory and uh, life would be, you know, great, happy days would be here again. And, um, and that actually worked. In fact, uh, uh, I, still have, I still have the spreadsheet and every once in a while, if I feel that, uh, that you know, we are, we are in a, in a, in a well and we need to climb out, I'll always go back to that. And so I don't use Excel for doing investment analysis. I do use Excel to climb out of wells and it works pretty well. So, so you always need not only in investing, but in life, uh, a rope to climb out of deep wells. 
So it is a guarantee that both in investing and in life, you will find yourself in deep wells. Uh, life would be quite boring if that didn't happen. So that's uh, commandment number six. And um, commandment number seven, thou shall be singularly focused like Arjuna. And of course, no one knows Arjuna better than uh, Arvind because uh, a few years back, Arvind sent me a nice painting and the painting showed a guy with a bow uh, firing at a target. And I think the guy was Arjuna in the painting. So anyway, there's an Indian epic which was written a few thousand years ago called the Mahabharat. And in the Mahabharat, there is a one of the heroes is this great warrior and archer called Arjuna. Arjuna. And um, when Arjun was being trained as, a, as an archer, uh, his, um, his teacher one day told all his students that he's gonna have a practical test for them. And uh, he basically set up a, a long pole and at the end of the pole, he put a fish uh, you know, kind of a, a sculpture of a fish, and the fish had a, a tiny blue, couple of blue eyes, small blue eyes. Then he put this pole in a in a kind of a pool of water, uh, a tub of water, and he told his students that he wanted them to look at the water, to see the reflection of the fish and the eye of the fish, and to shoot the eye out. So. And these were all kind of nobility, you know, prince, princes of different kingdoms. So the first prince steps up to take his test. And before he fires his bow, the teacher asks him, Dronacharya asked him, what do you see? He says, oh, I see the, the water, the pole, the fish. And uh, so the guy says, okay, sit down. You're not ready for the test. And then the second prince stands up. And again, the teacher asked him, what do you see? He said, I can see the pole, I can see the fish, I can see the eye of the fish. So the guy tells him, you're not ready to shoot, sit down. And one by one, the different princes stand up, tell them, tell their teacher what they see, and they're not allowed to shoot the bow. And uh, uh, finally, our hero Arjuna stands up, and he's asked what he sees, and he sees, he says that I can only see the center of the center of the eye of the fish. And um, so uh, Dronacharya tells him, fire at will. And, uh, and of course, he takes the eye out. And so one of the things, one of the lessons we need to learn from Arjuna is that we need to be focused like him. So anytime we're looking at, and especially when we're looking at these PEO1 businesses, usually there's more than one cloud hanging on top of the business. There are many clouds. And also, uh, there are always a lot of macro clouds. And also, even if there are no macro clouds, there are macro concerns. And what we need to do is we need to be like Arjuna. We need to focus on the business and only the business. And we, so to figure out the future of an economy is really hard. Uh, for me to figure out the future of even state of California is very hard. Or even the county I live in, you know, just kind of what's gonna happen. Um, so those are really difficult questions. So we have to simplify the world. And we, one of the ways to simplify it is to be like Arjuna, you focus on the business and you don't focus on the noise. And one of the things I, I noticed when I was in Istanbul last few days is there's a lot of noise. And if, if one can get past the noise and focus on the business uh, and just consider the nuances of the business, things can become quite clear. And uh, Quite, quite obvious. So uh, I did find a few things that I think we will pull the trigger on. But, but if I were to, 
if I were to look at those, the the macro situation, the company, country, or even the headwinds that the businesses are facing, there are there are significant headwinds. But if I'm if I'm buying at twenty percent of liquidation value, or at such a small fraction of future earnings, that uh, uh, and you know, like I said, these are these are fantastic assets. So uh, focusing on the center of the eye of the fish is the name of the game. That's what we need to we need to do. So do not get yourself distracted by looking at all kinds of macro things. I think you're best off ignoring all of them because anyway you can't predict them. Then uh, commandment number eight. Commandment number eight is. Uh, Thou shall never short a stock. So I don't think we need to spend much time here, but that's pretty obvious is um, uh, we don't need to figure out what's going to happen to Tesla. That's, uh, you know, we don't need to go long and we don't need to go short. That just falls in the too hard pile. And um, so like Tesla for me, the stock, not the car, is there for pure entertainment purposes. Just to watch from the the front row seats as opposed to being in the arena. So um, we just don't need to figure out exactly what's gonna happen and we don't need to go. So first of all, you know, commandment number three is you're gonna wrong, be wrong one third of the time. I think with shorting, you're gonna be wrong like 80% of the time. So both Buffett and Munger say that they've always been right on the stocks that they thought ought to be shorted, but they were always wrong on the timing. And the timing can get very painful. Also, the math is against you. Because the maximum you can make if you're right in a short position is a double. And you know, we're not going for doubles. And the maximum you can lose is you can go bankrupt. So there's no point making, making bets where the highest upside is a double and the highest downside is that you're out of the game. So I shall go to my grave without ever having shorted a stock. And I think you should do the same. And then, you know, commandment number nine comes from Polonius. And even though Polonius came long after Moses did, you know, he was, he was the character in Hamlet. And um, Polonius said to his son, neither a lender nor a borrower be. And uh, uh, so I think, I think uh, Buffett's uh, tweak on Polonius is, need neither a, a long-term lender nor a short-term borrower be. So basically, you don't want to, you don't want to introduce leverage into your life. Uh, I think that um, to finish first, you have to first finish, and um, we we want to make sure that we get to play the game, and we get to play the game for a long time. So the key is to spend less than we earn, and uh, put that difference in a compounding engine. If you're spending more than you're earning. Uh, then it's not a good good thing. And you know, I have a I have a blog. Some of you might have visited the blog, but I'll put an ad in for my blog here. Uh, my blog is called Chai with Pabrai. And uh, so, if you ever feel like having a cup of tea with me, you can go to my blog. And uh, one of the first posts I made when I, in fact, one of the 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 impetus to set up the blog was a guy named Mr. Money Mustache. Some of you, maybe you can raise your hands. How many of you have heard of Mr. Money Mustache? Just raise your hand if you ever heard of him. We have a few enlightened humans in the room, which is great. So Mr. Money Mustache is a good person that you should get familiar with. Uh, I always expect that I'm gonna hear that Mr. Money Mustache got divorced because his wife can't deal with him. But I think he married Mrs. Money Mustache. 
And uh, so I think she's even more uh, gung-ho about his methods than he is. Uh, but anyway, Mr. Mani Mustach, uh, I think he's in his early 30s now. But, but he, at 22, he was a software engineer. And he decided that he was going to be retired at the age of 30. And he was going to be retired at the age of 30, not because he got some exit from some company, but he would, he would retire at 30 being a software engineer, having just made a normal software engineer salary for eight years. So he ran his life for eight years. Uh, I mean, like for example, Mr. Money Mustache would not be caught dead in a Starbucks. I mean, paying four bucks for a coffee ain't happening. Uh, he's like more like five cents for a coffee. Um, so uh, I think he was, uh, he had like a 60% or 70% savings rate. Uh, so he, uh, he has a car, but I think he consumes about two gallons of, of gas a year um, on, in that car and uh, his bike gets a lot of mileage. Uh, you know, he's, he's bikes everywhere. And uh, he's a carpenter. I think he built most of his own house somewhere in the woods of Colorado. And um, and anyway, I think it's uh, it's worth going to his blog. Uh, I think you might have some difficulty with some of his methods, but if you even follow one third of what he does, you'll be on a great path. So he carefully looked at every expense us humans have. He decided that the way the economy is set up, which is we take a bunch of loans when we get jobs, which is we buy a fancy car, and have a loan and buy a fancy house or you know, have high rent and all that. That was all for the birds. He wasn't doing that. Uh, he took no debt. Uh, he drove a beater, I think. And, and basically he just looked at every line item uh, that he had expenses with and uh, nothing was going to be spent. So anyway, and of course, uh, now the funny thing is Mr. Money Mustache, through his blog, makes several hundred thousand dollars a year because his blog is so popular. And he's a little, he's a little disappointed about that. You know, he's kind of uh, sad about it because he didn't want to kind of be making all this money. He wanted to prove that he can, uh, you know, live the way he does. So he claims at least that all that money is going to charity. So. Maybe it is, which is great. But he's a great example to follow and first story on my blog, amongst many other good stories. And uh, and then finally, <laughs> commandment number 10 is, thou shall be a shameless cloner. You know, so cloning is very good for your health. Um, it's, it's just, a, you know, there are many smart people who are great investors. In many cases, their portfolios are visible to us because it's required by law. And it's a great shortcut to look at what are the highest conviction ideas of some very smart people. And we have uh, websites like Dataroma, for example, uh, in the US, which is tracking a bunch of investors and telling you what the highest conviction bets are. And uh, so I think cloning cloning can be really good for your health. and uh, that's that's the tenth and final commandment, and uh, with that, Darwin, we'll uh, open up for questions. So thank you. All right, Manish, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm sure we'll we'll jump into questions. So please uh, please have your ready to go. I'll 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 log in and uh, I'll log in one. The students have prepared after seeing seeing as much as they could online about you and. Um, the videos and, and uh, the books and reading, they've prepared many questions, but um, a common theme was just how you, you're sourcing ideas uh, across, you know, India, China, Korea, Japan, Turkey. How, how, are, you, <laughs> how are you finding ideas? I, I don't know if you're looking at the equivalent of 13 apps of uh, Turkish entrepreneur uh, investors, or um, how, how are you finding these one PE ideas or three PE? You know, I, I I think this was Ocean's Twelve, maybe it was Ocean's Thirteen, the movie. I 
I forget uh, which oceans it was, but it was, uh, I think when Clooney is talking to Andy Garcia, uh, was that in Oceans 13 or Ocean 12? Maybe, uh, maybe it's Oceans 13, but anyway, uh, you know, Clooney is trying, uh, trying to get his wife back, who's now with Andy Garcia. And uh, anyway, uh, he and Andy uh, are having a talk and, you know, Andy has some problem with some serious problem. And Clooney tells him, I know a guy. And uh, then Andy tells him, you know, like in disbelief, I have all these serious problems and you know a guy. And he says, yeah, I know a guy. So what can I say, you know, as far as Istanbul goes, I know a guy. <laughs> and <laughs> who shall go nameless for now. Uh, but uh, but no, I think the, uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, we would not be able to survive. I would not be able to survive if it weren't for commandment number 10. Uh, cloning is really good for your health. Uh, so I think I think in in India I I think in the last two years I have met with about a hundred and either met or visited about 180 or more businesses that are listed uh, and met with you know a lot of CEOs and uh, and teams and uh, visited a number of plants and uh, headquarters and all of that it's just been a great great education and. Um, and uh, in some cases there was cloning. In some cases, uh, it was just you know uh, actually doing the wo work. God forbid. And um, and uh, but but basically you know we we only need like two or three ideas in a year. We don't need too many. And uh, I think if one is uh, uh, cloning is a good shortcut. Uh, you know, one of the commandments that didn't make the top ten. Uh, uh, but almost made it uh, was, you know, when uh, when Buffett was asked the same question, you know, how do you how do you find great stocks and all that? And his answer was, start with the A's. And um, and Buffett was being facetious, you know, in the 50s, he went through the Moody's manual and he went through uh, it twice. And there were 20,000 companies in there and he looked at every single one of them. And uh, I bought the Moody's manuals a few years back from eBay, on eBay, just to take a look at them, the 50s Moody's manuals. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, they've got like three or four companies a page, and they've got the basic financial information on those companies. And you can very quickly get to see kind of what is going on in terms of, uh, you know, cash and cash flows and all of that. And in many cases, he was buying well below cash. Forget the earnings engine. He was just buying below cash, and uh, and such. But but he had to he had to uh, go through a number of you know thousands of pages to get to them. But that was fine. He had the time to do it. And uh, so I think that uh, you know uh, this is a treasure hunt. And if you enjoy treasure hunts, you'll enjoy being an investor. And there are shortcuts in the treasure hunt, uh, like like being a cloner. Um, but uh, but but uh, but it, but it works. I think so. Generally speaking, when I've gone to geographies like South Korea, or uh, or uh, now Turkey or China, I've definitely employed cloning to get some cover, and though that has worked well. And uh, and in the case of India, it's been a, a lot of uh, kind of looking at things. Uh, directly, but but many times we find in India we find parallels uh, that that have very strong histories in the U.S. or Europe, and uh, so then we can we can look at those. I mean, the, like you know, uh, the same type of business exists in these countries and has been ex existed for longer. So you can kind of look at the trajectory that some of these businesses have followed and then take it from there. Thank you for uh, having us. Speak up. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I want to go back to one of the questions uh, that I had with regards to 
temperament during the financial crisis. So you really talked about having a rope to get out of the well. How did you remain calm and confident so that you really pose that strong case for your investors? Yeah, so I think that, uh, that uh, you know, one of the things that my, uh, my wife told me actually is uh, after the financial crisis was that she never realized uh, the degree to which our wealth had dropped uh, and the degree to which uh, I was, you know, underwater and such. And she said I, she didn't really notice um, much change in my demeanor. Uh, and uh, so I think the thing is that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a quote that if, if wealth is lost, nothing is lost. If health is lost, something is lost. And if character is lost, everything is lost. And so we are only talking about wealth, which for the quote is, means nothing. And uh, so uh, quite frankly, I think one needs to put things in perspective in terms of what is important in life. And, uh, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if, if, if you look at the United States, you know, what is the percentage of people who are unable to, uh, uh, you know, make ends meet after having a good education and, uh, you know, in the sense that they are uh, not able to pay rent, not able to pay for groceries and those sorts of things. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a number that approaches zero. And, uh, and so the bottom line is that we live in a country which has tremendous safety nets of, of, of a number of different kinds. And so the bottom line is that even if things don't work out, uh, the odds are extremely high that you will be able uh, to get back on track. Um, you know, you, you may have uh, some period where you have to readjust, you may have to take a job instead of being on your own, that sort of thing. But, but, but the bottom line is that uh, uh, you will definitely be able to bounce back. And so I think it's, it's always good to keep things in perspective uh, about what is important in life. And, uh, and I think when I was going through the financial crisis, uh, I really didn't, uh, I mean, clearly the rope helped looking at Excel helped. Uh, but uh, my, my take is that uh, part, partially it may be that I had seen a lot of ups and downs in childhood, so that probably was somewhat helpful uh, just because I'd seen far more extremes than I was going through. And um, so, yeah, I think temperament is important. Um, if you find yourself on, on that end of things, uh, there is a form of... Uh, Buddhist meditation called Vipassana. Uh, you can Google that and uh, you can do a 10 day retreat in India where you basically, um, for the most part, are silent and uh, uh, having an austere life. But that might, that's work for many people I know. Uh, I have a bunch of people who keep telling me that I ought to do it. I tell them, you know, if you're already in Detroit, you don't need a bus to get there. And, um, uh, and and such. So, but you know, there's a number of different ways and techniques of getting there. So I think that, but some of it is pre-wired. I think it might be temperament, but I think we can definitely. I mean, a tendency is not destiny. Uh, a tendency does not need to be destiny. And so we 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 all as humans have tendencies, but we definitely also have free will, and uh, can get past those tendencies. So. So we can we can look at a number of different tools. The bottom line is that you have to figure out what rope works for you. Manish, actually on that subject, uh, you talked about the rope and the well and Excel on the professional front, and you mentioned uh, the personal front too. What what do you have a rope in that scenario? I mean, I I I think that uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just the way I'm wired, but. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't need much more than uh, than Excel. Uh, I mean, bottom line is, I think. I think uh, what I 
when I was going through the financial crisis, one of the things that was really exciting was just the sheer number of investment opportunities. Uh, so, you know, while your portfolio is crashing and burning, uh, on the other hand, you're seeing all these, you know, mouth-watering uh, investment ideas and such. And, uh, and I mean, I think like, for example, I made a, I found, you know, the whole commodity space just collapsed. And uh, I was finding so many ideas of investing in commodities. And they were really, really simple ideas that uh, I think every single one looked like at least a 5X. And uh, so because I didn't have a lot of time to study them, I made a basket basket bet with a bunch of them. Not, not a single one was a loser. Uh, almost every single one of them went up at least four or five times. Uh, I think one one investment I made, uh, Tech Cominco, which I sold after a 5X went up to a 10X. Uh, you know, so the, it was just, uh, I mean, one of the things that was very attractive about that time was that there was a, a lot of a lot of investment ideas and I was selling cheap stocks to buy cheaper stocks. You know, so, so that's one of the things I did. I used that period to to make the I, I tried to widen as much as I could the discount to intrinsic value uh, by by doing that. But on the personal side, I I mean I I think I think at the at the bottom of the financial crisis, uh, my net worth I think was down to eighteen million. Uh, there are worse problems in life than having a net worth of eighteen million. Uh, so I didn't have too many issues with that. Uh, of course, if I looked at you know peak to bottom, uh, it was a huge drop. Uh, I think you know I think peak had been somewhere. I think I'd paid tax and all, but something somewhere around north of eighty million. So uh, if I looked at it from peak to bottom, it was a significant drop. Uh, but but my take was that. Uh, Things looked really cheap. I liked what we owned. I think that I didn't have any leverage, uh, and I, I, I really didn't see any uh, reason to get. I mean, I'd seen with my dad, right, that you basically keep your senses about you and just keep chopping wood and move ahead, and uh, right. that's an important thing to to do. I uh, I didn't want to cut you off, but that's that wasn't exactly the question I was asking. I was asking, uh, you know. Outside of investing, when you need a rope and you're in a well, like out in your personal life, or in other I think the I think the exact exact same thing applies. You just need right. a different rope, right? So I think we we have to understand that present circumstances never last. You know, if you're having a really good time in life, that's probably not going to last. Right. And if you're having a really bad time in life, that's also not going to last. So one is you have to have confidence that when you're at the absolute bottom in life, that it is it is going to get better. Uh, it's just the nature of life. It's going to get better. And so once once you have that basic confidence that life changes, I mean, you know, we we have this, you know, number of people kill themselves, right? I mean, we have suicide where people just take their lives and such. I was I was reading somewhere that, I, I don't know if I got the numbers right, but there have been like more than a thousand people who've jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And I think there are like something like 30 of them who survived, who didn't die. And those 30, 100% of them regret the decision to jump. Okay, so basically if if we have a sample size of 30 out of, I mean, we can't talk to the people who jumped and actually, actually died, but we do have these few people who came back from the dead, if you will. And if 100% of people who came back from the dead are saying it was a big mistake to do it, probably the odds are that if we could talk to all thousand plus of them, the overwhelming number would, would say it was a mistake. And so then why do they jump? 
Well, I think they jumped because at that point, they were at the bottom of a well without a rope, right? So that's that's a very sad situation. But they, for whatever reason, did not have the confidence. And this is a this is why you know a certain percentage of humans, you know, a large number of humans attempt suicide. A relatively small number are successful. Thankfully, that's that's one thing good about uh, not not a not a large number are successful. Uh, but but I think that I think people people get to bottoms and don't know how to get out of the bottoms, right? And uh, and I, I think that the the only thing I can say is that one has to have faith that tomorrow will be better than today, and that whatever circumstances we are facing are not permanent. And and once we have so it could be finding it could be finding Buddhism, it could be finding a friend, it could be finding a loved one to talk to. It could be there there are a hundred different kinds of ropes one can have. I mean I think in 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 the case of a large number of people, uh their spouses are gonna be the rope. You know. Many times when I have I have issues uh, which I'm I'm just kind of concerned about whatever else. I'll just talk to my wife about it, uh, and almost always I'm feeling a lot better after that talk. So, so I think we can we can always find uh, the, the people around us. Uh, I think definitely if you reach out to friends and family when you are at the bottom of the well, it is only going to help you. That was a helpful perspective. Thank you. So, uh, other questions? Please, yeah, go for it. Um, thank you, Manish. I was wondering, back to the investment, if you could talk about your stake that you took in Google a few years ago, kind of through the prism of what you told us today, what brought you to it, and then why you pulled it up. Yeah, I think, I think Google, uh, Google is a very interesting company because uh, Google is a company that can make its revenues and its cash flows whatever it wants it to be. Um, uh, very few companies are in that circumstance. So the overwhelming majority of the products and services that Google provides to us, it provides to us at no cost. Uh, I mean, it doesn't even monetize those products. It just provides it without monetization. And they can turn on monetization engines on on a variety of products uh, at will, I think. In fact, the history of the company is really interesting because uh, I find it really interesting that this is a company that when it was founded, uh, the founders had no revenue model. Uh, they didn't. They had no idea how Google would ever make money. Uh, surprisingly, the investors who invested also didn't understand how this thing would make money, and they still invested in the company. And eventually, the revenue model was not even figured out by the by the founders. It was fig figured out by one of the one of the guys they'd hired, and this guy was not hired to figure out the revenue model. He was he was told uh, after I think a few months or maybe a year or so on the job. Oh, by the way, can you figure out how we can make money? And uh, and he went off to figure it out, and we he came back with AdWords, you know, and and they were off to the races. So. AdWords, which is you know responsible for a large portion of Google's revenues today, was not understood as a way to monetize by the founders when they founded the company or even after that. Uh, so similarly, I mean, if you look at like when they bought Waze, uh, the Israeli company that all of us use, um, there was no revenue model. Waze, Waze was just providing directions without uh, and. And they, when Google bought it, and even for a while to, when they ran it, they ran it for free. It was actually a loss because they had no monetization. And now, of course, you see all the ads on Waze, 
and uh, they they figured. So I think uh, Google is in a very interesting company because I think they can uh, they have a lot of flexibility in terms of what engines to turn on and 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 how to monetize and what to monetize and so on. They've got a lot of brain power to do it. So I really liked the business when I bought it. I think when I bought it, it was relatively modest uh, in multiple, I think, I think the forward earnings was in the teens, uh, which, you know, for me is like blasphemy to invest in something trading in the teens. Uh, but uh, even I got past that. And um, and and uh, I, and it worked. I think in about three years we had more than doubled our money, and I had actually intended that this is such a great business that I'll just keep it. I'll just keep it forever. But then I had these PEO ones show up, and uh, I needed cash. And you know, as hard as it was, you know, Google was history. I mean, once you have PEO ones a lot of things are going to be history. So I think Google will continue to do well. Uh, I hope they don't prove me wrong in terms of like whether the PEO ones, I think the PEO ones will beat what, what Google does uh, over the next several years. But uh, but no, it's a, it's a great company and I think it has a great future. Awesome, thank you for speaking with us. Uh, when you think about investing in India, you usually, like you started talking to management, so how do you judge whether the management is good or whether they're gross or like incompetent? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So historically, I I never met management. You know, for most of my career as an investor, probably out of the last, uh, you know, if you take the last 24 years, including the time when I was just managing my own money, probably at least 20 of those years or 21, 22 of those years, I never met managements, and uh, things worked out fine. I I I didn't think I could do that in India uh, because I think that one of the things I uh, can almost bet on is that the typical U.S. company I might look at, if I lose money, it won't be because of fraud. I can lose money because of my stupidity, but not because of fraud. So the the outright fraud cases in the U.S. in public markets are few and far between. Um, so they're not, um, at least in my in my almost quarter century of investing, I've never lost money, I think, anywhere because of fraud. I've lost money many times because of stupidity, but not because of fraud. So in India, I think there is a there's a much higher risk of fraud than there is in the U.S. So I I needed to be able to kick the tires. Uh, so far, I don't think we've invested in anything that is fraudulent. Uh, so I think so far the filter has worked, uh, but we will find out over time. Uh, but uh, I think uh, generally speaking, uh, one is, you know, you can make plenty of judgments when you meet managements. I mean, I, I have been in the room with frauds in India. That's kind of fun. In fact, it's uh, I think it's been a lot of great learning to be in the room with frauds because you can do, try to understand kind of how they work. Uh, but the other thing is that you can follow the cash. So I think one of the best ways to uh, avoid fraud, so there's a, there's a great book, uh, which I think a new edition just came out called Financial Shenanigans. Uh, I think Schlitt is the guy's name. I'm, uh, I've been in touch with the author now. I'm supposed to have a call with him in the next few weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I think Howard Schlitt is his name, but I'm not sure. But um, anyway, that's a great book. I think it's a, it does a really good job of explaining uh, how companies can mess with you with their, with their accounting and financial statements. And I think, uh, I think in India, one of the things I look for is uh, just follow the cash. I think if you follow the cash, uh, I mean, if you look at even in, in the US, if you look at someone, something like MCI, WorldCom, which was a fraud, uh, it would have been easy to spot if you focus on the cash, because basically they were they were converting expenses into capex, you know. So they were the what were ordinary expenses were being capitalized, and thus profits were being increased. 
But if you if you looked for the cash, you know what what is the business producing at the end of the year after all expenses? Uh, you would just see that it was a widely different number from net income for for Volcom, for example. Um, so I think I think the financial shenanigans book the guy is really good, uh, and I think that you can tell a lot uh, with just the numbers and the uh, the whether the cash is there or not. You know, in some cases we have fraud in India, like I think Satyam is a good example, where the guy doctored the bank statements. You know, uh, so in that case, uh, I think Deloitte, I think Deloitte was the auditor. Uh, in that particular case, uh, you wouldn't have caught it because the cash was a fiction. You know, what they were showing as cash on the balance sheet didn't exist. But that's a very rare case, you know. And, um, but generally you'll find that the fraudulent guy is basically one way or another playing with debt and, you know, they're kind of, you can, you can get to it if you just sift through the financials. Uh, so you were talking in your previous video that about uh, Vienna Chrysler being uh, one of the candidates of the Muntai Bagger in your list. Uh, that is a company run, it's a, a good business run by a good uh, CEO, but the CEO passed away like not too long ago. So should you cross it off the list? Yeah, so uh, it was very sad that Sergio Marchioni passed away. Uh, great guy. In fact, I just went to his memorial service in Detroit uh, last week. And, um, I, you know, I would, I would say this, that Sergio, um, Sergio was probably, in my opinion, amongst the top 20 business leaders to come along in the last 100 years, amongst public companies globally. And uh, he was a, and I think we will see some books and such come out about him in the next few years, but um, he was an extremely unusual leader. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I think Fiat Chrysler in 2000, Chrysler in 2009 was going to be, liquidated. It was very close to being liquidated. In fact, the decision by the U.S. government not to liquidate it was like won by a three to two vote uh, by, the, uh, by the auto task force. So uh, it barely avoided liquidation because they pretty much had given up on the business. They didn't think the business could be resurrected. And, um, and Sergio, I think without Sergio on the scene, I'm not sure it would make it. I'm not sure Chrysler would have made it. But but the thing is that what has happened with Fiat Chrysler since then is not only have they proven that they should not have been liquidated, uh, they are now outperforming the other two rivals. So Fiat Chrysler has now got best-in-class margins higher than GM and higher than Ford uh, coming from a, you know, a distant third. Uh, getting to basically number one. Uh, so, so I think that if you if you look at if you look at a leader like Sergio, so uh, you know, I I I knew Sergio was a very good leader in 2012 before we invested, but I went through about four different uh, recalibrations of Sergio. Uh, each time when I recalibrated him, it was at a much higher level than the last time. You know, I thought he was great, and then he was even greater and just kept going. And the last recalibration that happened with him, uh, for me, happened after his, his death. So Sergio knew a year ago, in July 2017, that he was in serious uh, problems with his health and possibly possibly terminal. He knew that uh, a year before he died, never told anyone, just his family, immediate family knew. 
And this is the guy who had a net worth of several hundred million, you know, 15 Ferraris or something. And he decided he's going to spend the last year of his life running Fiat Chrysler full out to hit the 2018 plan. And that's what he did. He basically ran a million miles an hour in his last 12 months uh, to push the company to where it needed to be. And one of the things he did before he passed away was that he set the plan for 2022. So that their Fiat has published a guidance and numbers for 2022 in June on June 1st of 2018. So about four weeks before he left the scene at Fiat and about seven weeks before he passed away, he published the blueprint. And I even I found it strange when he published that because he was publishing it a year before he was actually going to leave the company and a year before the next guy was going to be named. So if he was anyway going to leave the company in 2019, uh, if he had just left the company in 2019 and retired and so on, I think Fiat Chrysler would still execute and make the 2022 numbers. But he didn't leave the scene and he didn't just pass away. He actually martyred himself. And the management team, you know, he had about 35 direct reports and they used to spend weekends together, you know, because they didn't want to spend weekday time on meetings, architecting the future of the company. Uh, I met some of these people in Detroit. Uh, I mean, I think Mike Manley, who's the who's now the CEO. Mike Manley is not running the company for financial benefit, personally or whatever. He is on a crusade, and he's on a crusade to keep Sergio's legacy alive. He cannot screw it up, and he can't screw it up, and the 20, 30 other people around him can't screw it up, because uh, what I saw, what I, what I knew before I went to Detroit, and what I saw there is GM and Ford just don't, they don't have anything like this. These, these are people on an intense mission and they are going to execute on that mission. Nothing's going to stop them. So uh, they published their 2022 numbers. It's sitting at a P of two on 2022, num 2022 numbers. I think we're going to just let it ride. In fact, I think the P of two is understated. It's probably closer to P of 1.5 or 1.3 or something because it's heavily sandbagged. Um, so anyway, the, I think the company is in a very different shape than it was in 2009 when Sergio came in, and it's not a commodity company. Uh, they have got ridden of ridden of almost every commodity product. Uh, Jeep is about two million units a year. A very unique positioning. Uh, they pretty much killed every single car or product they made that was a Me Too product. They have no Me Too products in their lineup. Any questions? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, you mentioned, uh, recently mentioned that you were investing in uh, Turkey. Um, I was wondering what you think about currency appreciation and markets like that. You know, Arvind, maybe you can, uh, maybe you can repeat that. I couldn't, I couldn't tell. Sure. I, the, um, you talk a lot about investing in Turkey and in other foreign economies, not non-U.S. economies. Um, how do you think about currency risk? Is that a fair? Yeah. I'm sorry. How do I think about what? Currency risk. Oh, yeah. So it's irrelevant. Um, so uh, basically, basically the bottom line is that if you are right on the business, uh, the currency is not going to matter. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, like, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, my first investment, uh, in India, which I made personally in uh, 94, uh, 
basically went up like 150x in five or six years. The currency moved like 30% against me, 30 or 40% against me in that period. It was irrelevant. And and I think even now when we're investing at these P or one type situations, uh, I think the the currency is uh, well. In some cases, we are actually investing in assets that actually have an international value. And so the I'm not really I'm not really uh, concerned. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, I probably won't make an investment in in this company, but one of the things I found unusual about about Turkey was uh, so I visited a cement company in Turkey, and cement is a is an industry where you are very tied in geographically. Uh, you know, uh, transportation cost of cement is very high relative to production cost. So basically, uh, a cement plant typically uh, starts to get non-competitive once you are getting to be 100 or 200 kilometers or miles away from the plant. So it tends to be very geographically. So once you're about 200 miles away, another plant is going to have, typically have some advantage over you because the transport cost starts eating in. And so most cement plants are uh, geographically constrained. Uh, they can only supply within a region and be competitive. So when I, when I visited this company, I noticed that they had a, a small percentage, but a percentage of exports. And I'd never seen a cement company exporting cement. Uh, so I was kind of confused by that. I, you know, one of the things I, you know, the thing about this industry is that all, uh, all knowledge is cumulative. And I have met with about at least 10 cement companies in India, you know. And uh, one of the 10 CFOs I met, who I like a lot, just told me, this is a shit business. Don't invest in it. And let me explain why you don't want to invest in it. Uh, he instantly became my friend, and he he ran through the numbers and explained why I should never invest in the business. And um, and anyway, I I I had already gotten to similar conclusions, but not with his his uh, uh, precision. So before I even went into the, you know, I I go into these meetings like this cement company. I tried to even cancel the meeting. I said, listen, this is going to be a waste of time. I'm just never going to invest in cement. And uh, But the meeting was already set, so whatever. So we, anyway, so I said, okay, you know, uh, what I always find with these things, I think okay, I think it's going to be like an, a wasted hour. But I, it turned out to be like an incredible, every time I'm always wrong when I'm thinking that this is a useless business or whatever else, there's no point. It ends up being a great hour of business school. You know, and this was a, a, another great hour of business school. So I, I'm talking to the company. I said, listen, I'm, I'm noticing you got like this, you know, relatively small percentage, but like, you know, eight, nine percent of your volumes are being exported. So, you know, I'm the village idiot. Uh, you can't run cement. You can't transport cement very far. Can you explain what's going on here? Like, how can you get to actually exporting? So so the the CFO says that, our plants are sitting on the coast, and we have a dedicated port. And 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 I didn't realize, but Turkey, Turkey has incredible advantage on production of cement. And I think it must be because, and I still haven't figured all of this out, but I think that two big ingredients of cement, three big ingredients, are limestone, uh, cheap coal and cheap energy. Those are the three things you need to make cheap cement. And they have all three of these are cheap. I think I, I have to research the limestone, but definitely the coal deposits. Turkey has no no petroleum, it has a lot of coal. And the uh, the power rates are very low. So their cost of production of cement is very low in Turkey. And they are able to take that cement, put it on a on a ship, and 
get it to the east coast of the U.S. and get it into the Horn of Africa, and uh, not on the Horn, I'm sorry, on the other side, on the uh, on the west coast of Africa. And in both cases, they're very competitive. And of course, when they get into the east coast, they can't go very far, but just the way geography is in, in the U.S., we have high population density on the east coast. So once you're at the port, you don't need to transport very far to get to humans who need cement. And uh, so uh, basically, uh, when he explained the economics, so I told him, listen, the devaluation uh, makes you even more competitive. And so, so the CFO explained that their domestic cement business, he said, listen, don't look at our numbers in the past. I'm just telling you, they're going to be terrible in the future, okay? Because he says the brunt of the financial crisis has not shown up into our numbers yet. I said, I'm so grateful for that candor. Thank you so much. And um, and uh, But he said, look, what's going to happen is that by 10% or 9% of volume that's being shipped, I will. it'll take me some time, but I will get to 50% being shipped, being exported. Because I was competitive before, but I am way more competitive now because of the exchange rate. And so, so this is an interesting business in the sense that it's almost as if the currency uh, doesn't matter so much because if the currency drops further, he'll go to 70% exports eventually and such. And the other thing is the currency goes the other way. It probably is because the economy is getting better. So his his domestic volumes start increasing. So uh, I just found it interesting that, you know, the only other company that I know of like this is POSCO in South Korea. It used to always be that you couldn't really have a steel industry unless you had iron ore in country. And both Japan and South Korea proved that you could just bring it in and ship it out. And so POSCO, if you look at it in South Korea, you know, their, uh, their port infrastructure most one of the most advanced in the world. It's like in a U, where the the ships that drop off the ore are the same ships that pick up the finished product in just a U-turn. Uh, very efficient logistics. And so POSCO was able to bring all the resources in they needed to make steel and ship them all out and still be super competitive. And all of this works very well because ocean shipping uh, has become super cheap over the years. So uh, there's a great book you guys might enjoy. It's called The Box. Uh, I think Mark Levinson is the name of the author. And it talks about the whole uh, incredible transformation we saw because of the container. You know, we don't pay attention to containers, but container shipping transformed uh, shipping. And then uh, I'm reading another, uh, another book, which is even funnier in the same way. And, uh, I think it's called 90% of everything, uh, I think that's what it's called. Uh, but uh, this this lady goes on these container ships, this journalist, and she's kind of you know explaining the industry while being a passenger. And she has a lot of funny experiences on these ships, and it's it's a, her writing style is quite funny. So that's another great book, which is kind of a, a mix of entertainment and education. So 90% of everything, I think, is is that name, but. Uh, that's another great book. But anyway, so I think one of the things to understand about ocean shipping is for practical pur purposes, ocean shipping is nearly free. Uh, I mean, I can I can get from Turkey to the U.S. cheaper than I can get 150 miles inland into Turkey. You know, so it's it's the the quirk of ocean shipping. So anyway, hope hope that answers it. Thank you for taking time to talk this. Uh, in your book, you discuss um, investing in distressed businesses and in, uh, in, in, in distressed industries. Can you talk about what sets up for a good turnaround story? I'm sorry, I mean, I didn't get the second part of the question. The last part was what 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 groundwork is required for a good turnaround story in a in a great company. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, generally speaking, you don't want to bet on turnarounds. I think you know turn, most turnarounds don't work. Turnarounds don't turnarounds, if you will. 
so I think I think generally those are not good bets. I think like for example, when we when I invested in the auto industry in Fiat Chrysler, uh, the the industry was distressed, but there had been structural changes to the industry which made the recovery uh, almost for sure. So, so I think you don't want to be you don't want to be investing where you are making heroic assumptions about magic that management's going to do. I think that's not a good idea. But I think you can uh, you can make investments where uh, where basically uh, your um, uh, uh, your your basically uh, uh, you can see you can see the tread marks to where this is going and where it's going to end up. So uh, so I think that industries industries do get distressed, even countries that get get distressed like Turkey. But like for example, you know, if I looked at this cement business, you know, I can see how they've got flexibility uh, where I mean. Actually, what's happening in Turkey is the exporters are doing great, and uh, and the other thing I noticed is that the local prices have not adjusted as much. I mean, what has adjusted uh, immediately has been the imports. Those have adjusted, but things that are produced locally they haven't fully adjusted yet. So the exports are going to have an, a a stronger advantage with a weaker currency, and uh, so you want to you want to see obvious things. When you're going into these areas, you don't want to make heroic assumptions about what management is going to do or what's going to change. It should already be in place, but it's just that the market is missing missing it. <coughs> uh, have you ever invested in a business that has a, a competitive fault, which turned out to be illusional? And uh, what have you learned from this? I didn't fully get that. Uh, competitors who have what? Uh, competitive modes. That yeah. Turn out to be yeah. Competitive modes that turn out where the mode turns out to be an illusion ultimately. I'm saying the mode turns out to be what? An illusion. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is very common. You know, we're mostly dealing with illusions as far as modes go. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think the the nature of the nature of capitalism is that capitalism is creative destruction, and uh, you know, there used to be there used to be only one company that had that was in the Dow about 90 or 90 years ago that was in the Dow today. That was GE, and the one company is gone now. And like what I just saw in the paper. Is their new CEO has been unceremoniously been removed? So I mean, GE was a pretty formidable company, and I think still in aircraft engines, etc., they have a pretty formidable moat. But you can see that even a company like GE basically is having a lot of difficulties. And um, so I think moats uh, uh, moats get filled in. Far more frequently and far more quickly than most of us would think they should get filled in, um, and so your defense against that is the PE of one. So that's the only way to to protect yourself. Uh, so the PE of ones are good for your health because you take your cash out after first after the first year, or maybe after a couple of years, and then. Um, you don't you don't particularly care. You know, one of the things that uh, that I've been doing uh, for the last uh, few months is I set up this uh, uh, this uh, waterproof waterproof Bluetooth speaker in my shower, and I uh, listen to the Buffett and Munger annual meeting videos uh, because they posted all the videos from '94 till till last year on on the uh, I think the the CNBC website uh, buffett.cnbc.com and uh, so I think now I'm at year 2001 uh, I get through about half an hour a day which is great it's actually 
sometimes it's the most productive half hour of the day, I find. But one of the things Buffett was mentioning, I think in the late 90s, he was saying that, I think this was in right at the, when the dot-com bubble was speaking, maybe it was the year 2000 uh, or 99, I think 99, uh, basically he was saying that if you looked for companies that are making more than 200 million after tax in the United States, and this is let's say in the year 2000, um, there's like 400 of them, 400 companies in the US uh, in, in around 2000 were making over 200 million after tax a year. And he said that the US at the time had been around for like 225 years or 224 years, and in 224 years of open capitalism uh, with millions of companies, you ended up with just 400 companies that got to enough success to make 200 million a year. And um, I recently ran that number for today so I said, let's change the 200 to like 500 because, you know, there's been all these years of inflation and, and expenses and, and all of that. And the number of companies today that, that make more than 500 million a year in the U.S. is less than 500. And so the thing is that between 2000 and 2018, a huge number of businesses got formed and there were a lot of businesses that were emerging uh, at that time as well. And one of the reasons Buffett made that point was that he said that this, these companies making 200 million basically deserve, if they were going to continue making that money, probably deserved a market cap over 3 billion. You know, if you give it a 15 multiple or something. But the number of companies uh, making over uh, over three, uh, I mean, at that time, with a market cap over three billion, was many times that number. Was in the thousands, and part of it was at that time we had the dot com bubble going on. I think he wanted to prove the point that a huge number of these companies are going to disappoint because they're not going to end up with those. They're never going to produce the. 200 million to justify the 3 billion. And, and so even today, 18 more years have passed and we've had all this tech and everything else that's happened and the cloud and, you know, all these things that have happened. And those numbers haven't changed that much. And so the, the bottom line is that if you're investing, betting on the future, of these companies growing a lot, uh, you have to look at the the other side that not that many company make not that many make it over the fence, and uh, and so the the mortality rate is pretty high, and so there are two or three lessons from that. One is stick with the small and nano caps, okay? Because a lot of companies are basically in capitalism never going to get to two hundred million. Or 400 million or 500 million. They're just never going to get there. Uh, they have a higher chance of getting to 10 million, 15 million, 20 million or something. That's a lot easier than 200 or 400 million. And the second is, you know, be very, take care of uh, commandment number four, focus on the PEO ones. So I think, I think moats, uh, you have to, you have to uh, approach moats with a jaundiced eye. I mean, if I go back to this company in Turkey, the cement company, so one of the issues that comes up in cement, and one of the reasons why it's such a, such a terrible business in India, is there are limited barriers to entry. Um, I mean, there are some barriers in the sense that in India, the limestone deposits are only in certain parts of the country. Um, access to coal also is a little bit you know, it's not a given that you may have access to cheap coal or cheap power, but a lot of people can get past those three variables, and they'll definitely get past those three variables if you're making a lot of money. 
So even in Turkey, the this company, I mean, the thing I have to think about is if they really get into great times. I mean, today I think the thing is the replacement cost that which I question the CFO on the replacement cost makes it makes it prohibitive for them to put up new capacity. But at some point, if the numbers change, uh, then you know I'm not sure how strong those barriers are. You know, they may be they may be enduring for a while, or they may not. I I, I just don't know right now. So I think the the thing is that you have to recognize that people are constantly looking, it's just the nature of capitalism, to destroy your moat. They're just constantly looking to destroy your moat. And so what you really want to look for, uh, and there are very few, there are very few enduring moats. Uh, so you have to really uh, look far and wide. One of the interesting things about these enduring moats is many times the market doesn't price them any higher than the non-enduring moats. You know, sometimes market can't distinguish between enduring and non-enduring. And so if you can really identify an enduring mode, which are very few, um, and get into those, then uh, life can be really good. But uh, but I think the P of one is your protection against the illusional modes, if you will. Yeah, so uh, in your book, like you talk about the Kelly uh, formula, and I understand Kelly Palmer requires expected value in odds. So how do you uh, approach to estimate odds? Uh, I, I didn't get I didn't get that fully. Maybe Arvind, can you repeat that? Sure. Um, he, he, Hiroki asked in your book, um, do you talk about the Kelly formula and that mandates uh, the having a view on the odds of the outcome, and so how do you get to the odds? Yeah, so the Kelly formula discussion in my book was a mistake. If I had to rewrite it or come out with another edition, I would just skip that entire, I would not mention Kelly. And the reason I wouldn't mention Kelly is that the mistake I made was that Kelly really only works if you get to make the same bet a thousand times. and we don't get to make the same bet a thousand times in the stock market. So if you if you had heads was 51% odds, tails was 49%, and you get to bet a thousand times and you bet heads every time, uh, you know, and the payoff is two to one, you want to make that bet as heads every time. And over time you do well. But if you only get that chance twice, uh, and it's 51 to 49, it doesn't make that much sense, and the outcomes could be all over the place. So I think Kelly does, uh, I think, is not useful for what we try to do. Uh, thank you, Manish. Uh, apologies for making, uh, asking a question in a different direction. Uh, but uh, we all agree that uh, we should invest in something that we understand. But uh, you went one step ahead uh, once and quoted that uh, you don't understand 99% uh, of the businesses, that's 98, and uh, combining that with the P is of one, looking into that direction uh, specifically. Uh, so is that, uh, so I find the, these things really interesting, uh, how you look at them. So is that one of the reasons why you look globally, uh, trying to find uh, misplaced opportunities in uh, those specific businesses, and uh, uh, do you find some uh, challenges in, in that approach as well? And uh, how, how do you go about learning about into uh, new industry? I think I got most of that, Arvind, but can you just repeat just for clarity? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think I can struggle <laughs> to a certain extent, but I think uh, part of it is, you know, how do you increase your circle of competence? while looking globally, while looking for a PE of one. Yeah, so you know, so I think, I think, I think, first of all, circle of competence um, was not in the commandments because, you know, maybe it should be, but, you know, it's, it's the baseline. So the first filter 
has to be circle of competence. So if something is not in your circle of competence, it just shouldn't be, it should immediately be dropped from consideration, regardless of the price. So we have to stick to our circle of competence. Um, I think once we find that something's within our circle of competence, then we can look at the PEO ones and all of that and take it from there. Um, sometimes the PEO ones make it easy to get something into circle of competence because, I mean, like if I go back to the IPSCO example, uh, that the next two years earnings will, plus the cash will equal the market cap, Basically, what I needed to do was to handicap the odds of that actually being true. Just that statement. I didn't really need to understand the business that much beyond that because there was no debt. And if this was true, then any fool could see that I still have the plants, I still have the management, I still have all the other pieces, and the odds are high that it probably will make some money in the future. So in that case, I didn't need to really, you know, get into the weeds of figuring out exactly how strong or weak their moat was and whatever else, because I needed to spend a lot of energy on the uh, the resilience of the two-year cash flows more than anything else. Uh, so I think if you get to these very low price stocks, it can make your life a lot easier. Um, I mean, like I looked at I looked at some some companies in Turkey where I can look at like a, at a sliver of their assets and the sliver of their assets exceeds the market cap. And there's a lot more assets. So I actually, you know, looked at some of those assets. And so the thing is, I didn't really need to have a view on every thing that they own. I just need to have a view that they, they own enough that there's a lot of downside protection. And uh, so I think the, the thing is, you first have to, the first filter is circle of competence. And then after that, you get into all these low price PU1 and all that. And, and I agree with you that uh, when you start applying all these filters, there's not much left. And Munger's response to that is, why should it be easy to get rich? Yeah, um, so speaking of shameless cloning, I guess, are there any kind of companies that you're particularly excited about right now? And um, I guess, would you be willing to share any and walk us through kind of how you think about that? Did I hear a call for stock tips? <laughs> <laughs> Is that right, Arvind? I think so. <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to duck that question, but I would just say this, that... Um, you can you can look at my holdings on Data Roma. Uh, I think the only one that shows up now is Fiat Chrysler because it's the only um, U.S. listed company that we own, and uh, that should be enough to get you to be quite rich. <laughs> well, did you yeah, yeah. Uh, so you previously described um, your performance on the structure as a competitive mode. Um, are you finding that? As the uh, rise of index investing has driven other asset managers' fees downwards, do you feel like that mode is being eroded somewhat? Um, yeah, no, that that moat uh, is uh, as close to a permanent moat as you can get. So, uh, you know, the thing is that uh, what 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 I, what I have done is that clearly the the 0625 fee structure is a fee structure that is very favorable for investors. And it's favorable to investors for a couple of reasons. One is that it takes away any incentives for me to be just an asset gathering machine because I don't get paid more if I have more assets. Uh, I get paid if I perform. And... Uh, the second thing is that, uh, uh, you know, I just went through a 10-year period. I, I told you that in 2009, I was at the bottom of a very deep well, and we were down 70%. And then every year, the bar was moving by 6%. And 
we finally crossed the high, high watermark, including the 6% in 2017. So I went from 27, 2007 to 2017, living on fresh air and water. And uh, I survived on fresh air and water. It wasn't, wasn't it's some very healthy fees. So happy days are here again. And, um, but, but the thing is that uh, some of my investors, when they came to me, they came to me because they were enlightened about this fee structure being important. But what I have done, what I do once they become investors is I start brainwashing them. And, and over the years, they become completely brainwashed. And like after a few years, of my brainwashing, they are not interested in putting money with managers who don't have this fee structure. So then they'll come to me and say, Monish, you know, I'm very happy having you as a manager. I have some more money. I want to put this with another manager, but you know, they need to have this fee structure. Can you recommend someone? And I tell them, John, you know, I'm so sorry, but there's no one else. You know, <laughs> and uh, but keep looking. Maybe I don't know, and you can find them. And um, so, what what ends up happening is that they, uh, a lot of them, basically, even if they put money with other managers, they are not happy about the fee structure, and they're reluctant to put the money. So I think that from a proprietary funds perspective, uh, that moat is as relevant today as it ever was, because for a sliver of humans, um, and I think an increasing sliver of humans, that fee structure is very important. And, um, and so I think, I think that what I, find, what I find very instructive is that I can't tell you how many people I know, young, smart investment, investment analysts who become managers who set up their own fund and i always tell them all listen go with the zero fee okay don't mess with that and almost a hundred percent of them violate commandment number one so like i met a manager recently and he's got like i don't know six or seven million under management he just started and i told him i said you know i told you to go zero fee and you didn't go zero fee. And so he says, yeah, but Bonish, I, I need the money. So I said, the money is 70,000 pre-tax and uh, you have to have some savings. Otherwise, if you haven't done well in the investment business, you shouldn't be in the investment business, managing other people's money when you haven't done well for yourself. He says, yeah, I, I, have, I have a few years of runway if I don't get fees, but I want to increase the buffer. And so I said, no, that's not good. You, you take the fee away and you focus on, I said, I said at your 6 million, 7 million, you should be banging out 50% a year or 40% a year because you know there's a huge universe of opportunities you have that I don't have. And so I said at 40% a year, you don't even need other people's money. Just on your own money, you'll get rich. But all of these sermons fall on deaf ears. So hence, I have decided to put them in commandment form. And uh, I'm hoping there is behavior change, but my history tells me there won't be behavior change. Uh, when you're sourcing investments, do you look at final goods and then go up the value chain to find that's to find companies that might have like all monopoly or monopoly power within that certain sector of the value chain? Yeah, I think that's uh, it's always it's always very good. I mean, you really want. I mean, like I said, capitalism is brutal. You really want protected moats. So I think that I have I have what you would call 
you know, I, would, I call it a barbell portfolio. I think like about 55% of the portfolio, which is all time high is these PEO ones. Then there's about 10% cash and then about another 45% is what I call these enduring moats. I mean, so in some cases I paid up a lot more than PEO one because the moat was so strong, but it has to be a really strong moat to pay up. So like for example, um, India, India has three credit rating agencies. Um, you know, after the funeral business, the next business that probably is extremely resilient, but it's very hard to develop the moat is credit rating agencies. So if you look at, if you look at the US with Moody's and S&P, you know, and the financial crisis is a very instructive thing to look at. These guys, one can argue, caused the financial crisis. Uh, because, you know, without their AAA ratings, you wouldn't have had nearly as much damage as we had. Uh, so they were, they, they precipitated and compounded uh, the, the bubble and the damage. And uh, they were called to task, there were hearings, there were all kinds of, you know, demands for heads to roll. And both Moody's and S&P paid very modest fines. Nobody went to prison and life goes on. So even after nearly bringing Western civilization to its knees, uh, they continue to endure and thrive. What a beautiful business. The other thing about the business is it has no capex. I mean, you know, the funeral business, you actually got to buy land and hold it and all this stuff. Here you hire an MBA, give them a desk and a, and a computer, and maybe your all-in cost is, I don't know, 200000 or something. And that person may do, may generate fees that may be several million dollars a year. And so, like in India, these rating agencies, they collect about 10 basis points, typically. Sometimes they collect less on the instruments they rate. And then they collect surveillance fees. So their, the revenue and costs have no correlation with each other, the 60% plus margin business. And, um, and there's no history of these enduring guys going out of business, even after they screw up really badly. I mean, the one thing they're paid for is to give accurate ratings. And um, so one of the three rating agencies in India, we, we now own 10%, which is the maximum I can own. I paid more than a PE of one, but uh, they've got good, good growth engines and we we'll just keep it for a long time. Uh, just kind of on that note, I'm curious, what does your normal uh, decision calculus look like when you decide whether to sell an investment that you've held, other than opportunity cost for switching into new investments? Like for the one you just described, then what price would it have to go to for you to say, I'm out of this even if I don't have an alternative to put the money in? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, so, let me give you an example of why buy and hold is not such a good idea. So from 1988 to 2000, uh, the Berkshire investment in Coca-Cola, which, which uh, both Arvind and I are enjoying. Cheers, Arvind. And uh, um, basically, they put about a billion dollars into Coke and I'm, I'm gonna exclude dividends just to keep it simple. But the billion in, in 12 years went to 12 billion, approximately. So Berkshire got about a 12X return from 1988 to 2000 on the Coke investment, kind of mid 20s per year return, very nice. And then from 2000 to 2018, uh, it, it went up from a billion I mean, from 12 billion to about 18 billion. 
So in 18 years, it went up 50%, about 2.3% a year. So they made about 25% a year in the first 12 years, and they made less than about, well, including dividends, maybe they made 3.5% a year. Clearly, and there are almost no moats. In fact, I would say there probably is no moat that is uh, more resilient than the Coke moat. You know, it's kind of like the ultimate moat. And um, so here you have two guys who are really smart, you know, the smartest guys in investing. And they identified a great asset. They identified at a great price. They had a great run. And, but it hasn't been a great run for 18 years. And I think Warren, Warren at one point said, I think in the early 2000s, that it was probably a mistake not to sell Coke. Of course, today it doesn't make much sense for them because they have so much cash. They will just end up going to cash and at least they're getting a few percentage points. And there's a new CEO and might change. Might, uh, he looks pretty good. After uh, a few decades of idiots running the company, we're back to having intelligent life. So anyway, uh, basically, uh, so if you look at a if you look at a business like let's say let's say we look at Mastercard. So Mastercard has had an incredible run over the last I mean since it went public. I, 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 I don't know the numbers, but I think it might be more than 50x in the last 10 years or so uh, that it's been public. It's been a huge home run. And a lot of smart investors own MasterCard. If you go on Dataroma, you'll find a who's who of investors from uh, probably Todd Coombs at Berkshire. Uh, you know, we've got... Uh, well, I think I can pull it up. If you give me a minute, let me just pull up the August list of MasterCard investors. Give me a second, Arvind, because it's quite an interesting list. Yeah, so the, the people who own it in uh, descending order of percentage of the portfolio, Chuck Acri, Tom Russo, Sequoia owns it. It's about 7.6%. 7, 7 My good friend Guy Spear, Bill Nigren, Wally White, Streety Brown, Tom Gaynor, it's a very small part of his portfolio though, and of course, Warren Buffett, which I think is one of the two managers and such, and, um, and so on. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an August list of uh, people, like for Tom Russo, it's like 12.5% of the portfolio. Uh, for Chuck Akery, I think it's 13%. Uh, so if you, if you ask me what's gonna happen to MasterCard from let's say 2018 to 2030, I wouldn't be surprised if the numbers are something like Coke, you know, uh, in fact, I, it, it would be, if you, if you run the math, I mean, I think it's at 50 times trailing earnings. If you run the math using, you know, the, the market cap versus the, uh, the current earnings, which is 2% of the market cap, and then you start discounting that and then look at what kind of return you want. And if I want a 25% return or something, I mean, it's just, you just can't get there. Uh, so, so I think the the thing is that it's not about, in my opinion, buying great assets and holding them forever. I think I think uh, probably the best thing to do is some middle ground where, if it's a tremendous asset like Mastercard, probably not a bad idea to let it run past 40 or 45 times earnings. But I would say at present prices, I would be a seller. You know, I would take my money and move on. One well, quick question. Uh, you're an active learner and an avid reader. I'm just wondering how often, how many hours, maybe a week or a day that you were spending reading and researching. And also, uh, 
what are some of your personal traits that you believe have uh, contributed most to your success? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Well, you know, I don't really have a, I don't really have a a set schedule in the sense what I what I do try to do is I try to run an empty calendar. Uh, so the only thing I put on my calendar once a year is the Arvin talk, and then I just keep the rest of the calendar empty. And um, and but basically, uh, I mean, I think like. Uh, like this week, I think, uh, for example, Arvind's the only guy on my schedule. I mean, I had Turkey earlier this week, but I can't think of anything on my schedule next week or the week after, or the week after. And so <laughs> basically, basically I, I try to make sure, you know, I don't like, I don't enjoy meetings very much. I do enjoy the, now I enjoy the, the company visits a lot because I think it's just, you got great professors, better than any professor in any business school, other than Arvind's. And um, and uh, and you got tremendous faculty, and you are paying nothing, you know. And these guys are teaching you all kinds of things, which is great. Like I love the the cement lessons I got from the CFO in Turkey. It was it was a blast. And um, so so I think the thing is that the first thing I learned from from Buffett and Munger is that you run an empty calendar as much as possible, so uh, don't clutter the schedule. And beyond that, you know, I'm basically a gentleman of leisure, so it depends on what shows up on the radar. I mean, if I am hot and heavy, you know, looking at some business or something, then I'll drop all the other reading and just go into that. And if I don't have enough of that, then I'll go back to the the general reading and, and so on. So it just goes back and forth and i think that um, i think that the 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 traits that have helped me um, i think it's very important uh, to be excited about life and to be passionate about you know your your day ahead or your week ahead or whatever else and um, so so I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say, you know, I rarely do this, but let's say I go have lunch with someone, you know, and all of us are different, but usually when I have these lunches, after I come back, uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm not that excited about the way the time was spent. Sometimes I am, most of the time I'm not. And so what I did over the years was I made those types of events very rare. So, you know, you kind of try on different gloves and you just see what fits. And then based on what fits, you just kind of, you increase what you really enjoy in your life and you decrease what you don't enjoy. So I think if you, so part of this you can get to with, uh, you know, psych testing, Myers-Briggs and, uh, maybe with some industrial psychologists and such to really understand who you are. And the closer you are to acting out your your inner traits, uh, two things are going to happen. One is you're going to accomplish more, and the second is you're going to be more satisfied. And so I think it's very important to, uh, I mean, all of you, are, I think, uh, Arvind, are they mostly part-time or full-time? Uh, mostly full-time. Yeah, so I think in most of your cases, unfortunately, at this at this point in your lives, you don't have much choice about your schedule. You know, you pretty much, you know, you've got a busy schedule, a lot of classes, a lot of things you're learning, but hopefully it's fun. I think it should be quite a bit of fun because you have some some choice into what classes you're taking. Uh, but once you once you get out into taking jobs or in the real world and so on, I think then I think you want to be really careful about making sure that on a daily basis you are very excited about life. So if you go to work for people, don't take the highest offer, take the person or group or company that you're most passionate or excited about. Um, also Buffett, Buffett says that, you know, don't say I'll do X and then I'll do Y. 
and then I'll do Z and after working for someone, I'll do something else. Uh, he says that's like saving sex for old age. So I think you want to you want to get to where what your goals are relatively quickly in a straight path rather than a circuit circuitous path. So I think those are those are the important things is I, I constantly look at how I spend my day and and I I'm trying to uh, always tweak it uh, in a way that makes me energized and excited. I mean I, I I would say that if I you know one of the one of the things that's happening that I notice now is that it's hard for me to find uh, enough companies in India to meet when I'm going to India now because I've met so many of them that. Now it's the travel will get more intense to smaller cities and so on. Uh, probably won't be as much fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun when I was meeting seven, eight companies a, a day uh, in one city. Uh, that will probably drop to two a day or something uh, and, uh, and more flights and such. So uh, not as much fun, but uh, better than zero, you know. So. Um, so I think I think uh, just 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 try to get to a lifestyle where the glove fits really well, and uh, and tweak it to constantly ask yourself that are you are you energized and excited? I think if you're if you're passionate and excited about what you're doing, by definition you'll do it very well. Anish, I think that's a great place to stop. So. That, thank you so much. This has been this has been fantastic, and uh, that's that's just a great note to end on to, to focus on what energizes you. That's that's fantastic. All right. Well, uh, Arvind, it was another great session. I uh, very much enjoyed it, and uh, thank you, and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.